I'm a, I'm a product of the Air Force, and I know there's some guys, Tom, I know there's some ex-Air Force people in here. And in the Air Force, when you are briefing like a senior official, you want to give them the bluff. You know, you know what the bluff is? The bottom line, what is it? The bottom line up front, right? So they know whether they can pull chocks early, right, and go do whatever they're going to do. At, because you're going to tell them what you're going to tell them, and if they don't care, they can peace out. So pull chocks, that's a, uh, I'm a pilot too. That's an airplane thing. When you're communicating to the guys on the ground, you can't really talk to them. So you give them this signal. That means, hey, pull the chocks out of the wheel so we can get out of here. So I'll tell you what we're about to talk about. And if you guys want to pull chocks, hey, that's between you and God, all right? <laughs> so there it is right there. It's really simple. And some of you guys might think it's even too simple. It's knowing God. It's a question. It's in the present, and it's continuing. It's knowing God. And it's if you're knowing God, how is that affecting the way that you're going to live your life? So that, that's pretty much what we're talking about here. And this topic pretty much assumes that you're a Christian. And we're in church, so I know that's a fair assumption. But as we all know, that's probably not always an accurate assumption, right? So if what I'm talking about today seems like foolishness to you, I, I just ask you to hold on and hang tight till the end. Uh, hang tight with me. So... If we know God, then our understanding of God would directly affect the way that we live our life. That's what we're talking about. Because you have a choice. You can either be an effective Christian through your knowledge of him, or you can be an ineffective Christian, right? I used to think that there wasn't a such thing as an ineffective Christian. But uh, let, me, let me make my point here really quick. Does anybody know where this is? This is interactive today. I told you, James is not here. This is, this is different. Does anybody know what city this is? No? Okay, this is uh, Hiroshima, or Hiroshima, uh, however you pronounce it, right? With that, does anybody know what that building is right there? It's the A-Dome, the A-Bomb building. I've been blessed. Like I say, I, uh, I'm a pilot, so I fly for the uh, Air Force here, the C-5, the big cargo planes that are annoying you guys, flying up, you know, above your heads. And I also fly when I'm not doing that. I'm flying for Delta. But the Lord has just blessed me to do a job that I love, and I've actually had an opportunity to walk right there. I've been to Hiroshima, and I've walked right beside that building. Um, quick history lesson, August 5th, 1945, what happened in Hiroshima? There we go, right? We dropped a big bomb. And it's crazy. I'll give you another look at that building when you get up there. It looks decrepit. It looks like it's falling apart. But I think that looks pretty darn good for having an atomic bomb drop literally 100 yards from right over top of it, right? And it's still standing there today. Like I said, I've been there. I've seen that building. And it's even more incredible when you notice that this is what the rest of Hiroshima looked like after that bomb was dropped. It was flattened, totally destroyed. So you're like, ah, I didn't come here for a history lesson, right? No, you didn't. So let's get to the uh, theological point that I'm going to make. Our first verse is uh, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. It's in your bulletin. You can turn to it or follow along with me, and I'll read it. It says, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one that's already been laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring forth to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it's burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through flames. So it's pretty easy to connect the dots of where I'm going with this, right? With our knowledge of God, every day we have everything it takes to live a godly life. And every day that we go throughout this world, we are building a spiritual building, brick by brick, if we're doing it with costly stones and precious materials. Or we're using hay and straw. So I don't, know what it, I don't know that anybody really knows what it means like to suffer loss in eternity. Because the Bible says, I used to think there was no such thing, like I said, as an ineffective Christian. But the Bible says that some will get into heaven as if escaping through the flames. And if you built your spiritual building daily using wood or whatever these other structures were using, when it hits the test of fire, it's going to get burned down. And you don't want that. I heard the joke once someone said that there was a smoking section in heaven. And obviously, they weren't talking about smoking. They're saying all the people that just got in by the skin of their teeth, right, <laughs> putting out the flames. And that's what it says right here. If it's burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. So that's what we're talking about. Being an effective Christian in this life or an ineffective Christian. So the goal is to build that spiritual building, and we want to do that. And we're actually, we're going to look at that today. Focusing on building that through our knowledge of him. 
So here's uh, 2 Peter 1, 3 through 4. It says that his divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us every, he's given us very great and precious promises so that through them, you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. So I'll, I'll break that down really quick for us. Through our knowledge of him, our knowledge of God, we have everything we need, not a few things. We have everything we need to live a godly life. And in that, in our knowledge of him, there are great and precious promises. And standing on those promises, we can partake in the divine nature. So without getting into, you know, theological debates of what that means, participate in the divine nature, different people have said different things about it, I think we can all kind of agree, based on the context of this verse, it pretty much means joining with the Holy Spirit in us as Christians and living a life that has spiritual impact on earth participating with the divine nature. So we'll continue with uh, 2 Peter. But uh, first, before we get there, I'm talking about living a godly life through the knowledge of him, but we don't want to make the mistake of just putting knowledge in our head. And I think a lot of people do that. A lot of people, well, hey, let's read through the Bible in a year. Not that that's bad, but let's do it so we can gain knowledge. And some people use that knowledge as a sword, you know, to win arguments and that kind of thing. But that's, that's not what we're getting at. We know that knowledge puffs up, right? It produces pride. We don't want knowledge, just knowledge, solely knowledge. The goal is to know, is not to know about God. That's not the goal. The goal is to know God. So that, that's what we're talking about here. So back to Second Peter. The very next verse after the one we just read says this. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, goodness knowledge, knowledge self-control, self-control perseverance, Perseverance, godliness, godliness, mutual affection, mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. Like we just talked about, ineffective and unproductive. And it says ineffective and, or unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what we want to avoid. So here's those qualities we we're talking about kind of laid out, and I don't, I don't want to be too legalistic about it. That it has to be step by step by step. You know, you might have one or the other. I, I'm just using it as illustrative purposes, and I think it's a, a very good way of pointing out the process of growing as Christians more and more like Jesus Christ every day. We call it sanctification, growing in him, because obviously it starts with faith, right? We know that we are saved by grace, which is available to everybody through faith, faith being the vehicle that we're saved. So it starts with faith, and then when the Holy Spirit comes in us, we are a new creation altogether. Faith to goodness, and we should have the outflowing of that in our lives, right? And then really early on there is knowledge. We need to gain some knowledge. We have to if we want to be an effective Christian. We can't just come here on Sundays and be spoon-fed and go about our business for the rest of the week, right? We need to do something and gain that knowledge, and that leading to self-control, so on and so forth. And ultimately, uh, the goal is love, right? God is love. Jesus even said it. The greatest commandment is this. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and then love your neighbors as yourself. I mean, ultimately, that's, that's what we are progressing to. So, like I said, we're going to focus on that through the revealed knowledge of God. And so it begs kind of a simple question, right? How do we get to that knowledge? It's a simple question with a really simple answer. He's revealed himself to us in pretty much two basic ways, through creation and through his spirit. Through his spirit, there's a primary way that he's revealed us revealed himself to us. And that's right here. That's the Bible. And you guys are saying, no, that's, well, you guys probably aren't saying it because this is Vista, right? You guys. Some people, scoffers, right? They might say that, uh, no, actually, the Bible is written by man. But if you look in 2 Timothy, it's not. Chapter 3, verse 16, it says that all scripture is God-breathed, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be equipped for every good work. So this is the primary way that God has revealed himself to us. But as Christians, we know that when we become Christians, the Holy Spirit comes and indwells in us, and the Lord can talk to us, right? So he can reveal himself to us in us. But we, you know, we can't, we can rely on that, but we have to be careful, especially if we're immature or new in our faith, because there's a lot of other voices trying to talk to us, and that voice can get muddled. So you always have to take it back to the primary vehicle of his revelation, which is the Bible, and make sure that what you think the Holy Spirit is saying to you is in line with what it's saying in the Bible. And the same thing with others. 
You know, we could have somebody up here speaking to you, but if you're just coming on Sundays and this is the only thing you're getting, hopefully you're in a good church, right? You guys are. James is awesome. You guys are in a good church. <laughs> Trust me. He's very biblically based. But some people are in churches, I hate to say it, that aren't, right? And if you're not mature enough as a Christian to get into this Bible, the primary vehicle of his revelation, and check what you're hearing that other people are saying, then you can be led astray. And unfortunately, um, that happens. So through the Bible, we get insight into his nature and his divine attributes. It tells us that God is infinitely powerful, he's timeless, he's infinitely knowledgeable, he's incomprehensibly loving, and ultimately, he's unknowable in his full knowledge of who he is. So we'll run through those real quick. He's infinitely powerful. Romans 1.20 says that since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. So they are without excuse. Psalms 19.1-4 says the heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Creation is screaming of the infinite power of God. So this picture that's in the background, I, I chose this actually for a reason. I'm a bit of a uh, nerd, a little bit of a sca- uh, space geek. I love Star Wars. Can't wait for that to come out. But that's a whole, that's a different conversation. This picture, evidently, and I was looking online with these, you guys have seen them with the stars blurred or whatever. Evidently, they're not too difficult to take. I probably couldn't do it. My wife, Jenny, she's a little bit of a photographer. She might be able to do it. But with any simple camera, as long as you have the patience and you know how to set the exposure, you can set it up, and as the Earth spins, you can see the stars blurring. To me, that's, it's an incredible picture of this planet that we have been put upon that has air, oxygen, everything we need to survive, and it's spinning, just tumbling in an infinite galaxy. Edwin Hubble was a uh, kind of a pioneer with telescopes, and way back when, 30s, 40s, I don't know, um, he took one of those telescopes and he pointed it at a little small patch in the sky, just a small little tiny speck of the sky in between some of the visible stars that we can see. And when he looked, and he looked past those visible stars, he, see, he saw other specks of light, which at first he thought were just other more distant stars. But he'd come to find out that they weren't just distant stars. Those were whole galaxies with their own cluster of trillions and billions of stars. And I know I'm probably not doing a very good job of, uh, of explaining how incredibly, infinitely powerful God is. But if you think about that, Psalm 19, 1 through 4 says, The expanse is declaring the work of his hands. His eternal power, his divine nature is being clearly seen in the infiniteness of space. I mean, the further we look, the more there is. That's his creative power speaking to us about who he is. To me, that just blows me away. He's timeless. He's eternal. 2 Peter 3.8 says, Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. Psalm 94, A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has gone by or like a watch in the night. I mean, these are simple figures of speech trying to express to us something that really we can never really fathom. We, we walk in a linear timeline. Everything has a beginning and an end. Our lives, the earth, the universe starts and finishes. But if we could really comprehend it, all of that is squeezed down to one tiny point of you guys sitting right here in time and space, and God sees us in that whole timeline in this tiny point in time and space. I don't understand that, but this is the God that exists outside of all that. To me, that's amazing. He's infinitely knowledgeable. Oh, Lord, you've searched me. You know me. This is Psalm 139, 1 through 2. You know when I sit down. You know when I rise up. You understand my thoughts from afar. And then Matthew 10, 29 says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside the Father's care. And even the hairs on your head are all numbered. And again, some people might say, Yeah, yeah, I could count the hairs on my head. But God doesn't only know the hairs on your head. He knows the hairs on everybody's head. And he doesn't just know the hairs on everybody's head. He knows the individual molecules and atoms that make up the hairs on everybody's head. And not only that, but he knows the individual particles that make up the molecules of everything in existence in those galaxies and stars beyond that we can even see. He knows that. But not only that, he knows every probability of every outcome, of every interaction, of every particle that makes up the entire galaxy I mean, to me, all-knowing seems too small of a word to explain the infinite God of the universe. He's incomprehensibly loving. God is holy, perfectly holy. That holiness separates us, sinners, from him for eternity. 
That's just the way it is. It's black and white. We can't really bargain that away. His infinite holiness separates us because we're sinners. Every little white lie, every little maybe proud little moment you get when you take pride in what you've done and not what God's given you, even though nobody sees it, even though it's really small, that's enough to separate you from an infinitely holy God for all of eternity. But God is incomprehensibly loving. John 1, 4 through 8 says that God is love. John 8, 39, or Romans 8, 39 says, that there is nothing that can separate from us from the love of God, and that love is revealed through Christ Jesus. When there was no way, when his holiness separated us from him, he transcended space and time, came here, lived a life, 33 or so years, and died a horrific death to bring us back to him, to bridge that gap. That, to me, is incomprehensible love. And yet other people have died horrendous deaths, and I guess you could argue have died wor- worse deaths in history, maybe, but who has left the infinite comfort of living in perfect unity with himself? And comfort, that's such a small word. I can't even imagine what it's like to exist as such as an infinite God. Who's left that to come here and suffer the indignities of this life as a human being and then die a horrendous death? I think we can't understand the infinite love that he has for us because we really can't comprehend what he left to come here and leave this, lead this life and die for our sins. And even, we just ran through like 10 verses there that kind of describe, which is really indescribable, God, right? But even with all that, we, we still, with this whole book that we have, 1,000 pages or so of his, uh, his revelation to us, we still ultimately cannot know him in his fullness. Romans eleven thirty three 33 talks about the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. It says that how unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable his ways. How unsearchable are his judgments. How could a 3.5-pound brain that we all have that's made up of neurons and synapses, how can that finite bit of material really comprehend the infinite? There's a physical limit on what we can understand, and we have to understand that and we have to accept that. Some people don't. Maybe it's pride, maybe it's the desire to control our lives and our destiny, but we want to have all the answers, and, and we won't always have all the answers. So why go through those verses? Most of you guys know all that stuff, right? You guys have heard those verses before. Because, going back to Second Peter 1, we have to know him. In the knowledge of him, it starts there, in the knowledge of him is everything we need to live a godly life. And then we need to know how big he actually is, because I think we forget. I really do. As we go through our, I know I do. As we go through our lives, we forget how big God really is. We forget he's infinitely powerful. He's eternal. He's timeless. He's infinitely knowledgeable, incomprehensibly loving and ultimately unknowable in his fullness. So with that, you got to ask the question, how are you guys living your lives in light of the knowledge of this infinite God of creation? This book right here is jam-packed on pro- in, with promises, and that's what First Peter said, right? Through those promises, we're able to partake with the divine nature. Are you taking those promises? Are you reading this book? Are you, are you living that out? So I've, uh, some of you guys, I'm not trying to act like I'm more wise in some of this stuff. And you, Lord knows that's not true. Some of you guys have a lot more wisdom in spiritual things than I do. And some of you guys have lived a lot more life than I have. But in my 25 years of being a Christian, the Lord has, has taught me one big thing that he keeps hammering home. And so uh, when I was asked to preach, I'm like, well, obviously I want to talk about that thing that the Lord keeps hammering home in my head. Not because I'm just the smartest guy when it comes to it, but it's the thing that the Lord has put in front of me. If you guys know the AM stations, 1100 and 630, anybody? They're great. You know, I, I listen to them a lot of times going to and from work. It's a good way to redeem some of that time that you're just droning. And when I'm listening to those stations, there's great Bible preaching pastors on there. And, they're, and what I found out listening to several of them is that a lot of them have a resounding theme in their life, something that the Lord has put in them, hammered home. And that's what they talk about, and they come back to it a lot of times, you know, when I'm listening to the same things. So that's what the Lord's taught me. So that's what I'm going to talk about here. Please don't think I think I know it all. I don't. But he's taught me two things, or he taught me one thing about, uh, about Christians. And you can, agree, you can disagree with me if you want. That's totally cool. And you can say that I'm oversimplifying because I probably am. But he's taught me there's really just basically two types of Christians in the world. Christians who, when you read those verses, say, wow. We have a big God. 
and Christians who either forget or don't read those verses or don't know, and their God is very small. Now, God is who he is, regardless of how we view him, right? But it's our view of God. Either, there's, either you think he's big and you view him, and all of that, his majesty and all of that incredible stuff that I can't even come up with really good words to describe it, or you don't. Or he's relegated to some pages in a book that's sitting dusty on your shelf where you come and you sit on Sundays or maybe in your Bible studies, but then you go about your life the rest of the week and you kind of forget about it. It's one or the other, right? And I don't want to oversimplify too much because it's not really a binary scale. It's not ones and zeros, right? Sorry, I just saw some friends of mine I haven't seen in a while. Hey. It's not a binary scale, right? It's not on and off, yes or no. We're not either a big God Christian or a small God Christian. Predominantly, we're one or the other, but a lot of times it's kind of a continuum, right? You know, we're a big God Christian, we realize how big he is, and then boom, life hits us in the jaw, right? And we kind of stagger back and we forget. And we kind of wallow in our problems and we forget how big he is, right? So the question you got to ask yourself is what trajectory are you on? Are you a big God Christian? If you are, great. Keep going. Keep reading. Keep learning. Because through our knowledge of him, we've been given everything we need to live a godly life. So we've got to keep building on that knowledge. If you're not, you need to take an inventory of your life and see if what you believe is really what you believe. And then you need to start focusing and working your way to becoming a big God Christian. So there's several characteristics that I've noticed about Christians that have a big God or a big view of God. And one of the big ones that can't, comes to me is they actually live like, like they actually believe in those verses I just read. They actually believe that in our knowledge of him, we've been given everything we need to live a godly life. They believe that. They believe that every day that you go through life, you're building a spiritual building, either brick by brick with costly stones and precious metals and good stuff that'll, that'll keep your building standing if the A-bomb hits it, or you're using wood and hay and straw. They believe that, and they live that out. They realize they'll never have all the answers. They realize that God is ultimately incomprehensible. We'll never know exactly why things are happening, good or bad, and they're cool with that. They're okay with that. They don't want so much control over their lives that they have to have all the answers. And when they don't, there's got to be a reason and they can figure it out. That's not the way big God Christians live their life. In short, they have an eternal focus. Their eyes are up. As they're walking through life, every day they're looking up. They're looking past what can be seen. Past what can be seen physically with their eyes. They live a life of faith. Faith in Hebrews 11 one says the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things unseen. Big God Christians are convinced of what they can't see. They walk by faith and not by sight because they have to. They have to. So, again, my opinion, James asked me to preach, so I got to throw a couple of opinions out, right? In my opinion, there are two verses, I think, that kind of encapsulate what a big God Christian is and should know. And I think there's two verses that we should, if we want to be big God Christians, either commit to memory or at least be familiar with and understand. First and foremost, which I say is the quintessential big God Christian verse is Romans 8, 28. And most of you guys know this because I know I'm, I'm here at Vista with a lot of big God Christians, right? And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who've been called according to his purpose. And to me, this verse is, so, is, is such a big God Christian verse because it encapsulates all those things that we talked about, that list of how incredible God is. It talks about his providence, his direction in our life, his control over our life. And you have to have it, and you have to believe it for this to make sense. Because, like I said, when life hits you in the jaw, when something happens, you have to understand that there's a God who's infinitely powerful behind the scenes, weaving everything together in a way that you'll never comprehend. It's ultimately for your eternal good and his glory, even when you don't understand it. But key point, we can't make the mistake of substituting the word good for easy or good for comfortable. And that is a key point, and I think we have to be really wise as we go through this life because there's a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing that are peddling this, that everything works together for your comfort. 
for your ease if you're a believer. Yeah, don't be fooled. Not everything that is good for you is comfortable. Sometimes you might have cancer in your arm, and they got to cut your arm off to save your life. That's not comfortable. That's not easy. Sometimes medicine tastes bad, but it's good for you. Please don't forget that. Everything that happens in your life, it might not be easy. It might not be comfortable. But it's for your good if you're a believer. So I got, I got a little example here. This is my cell phone, right? And my cell phone is cracked. And my cell phone has stickers of Doc McStuffins on it. <laughs> and both of those are because of my four-year-old daughter, Olivia. But that's, that's a different, uh, different story for a different time. <laughs> Just like most of you guys here, I'm sure most everybody, who doesn't have a cell phone? That's crazy. Everybody here. There we go. Who, who here who over the age of 18 doesn't have a cell phone? Nobody, <laughs> right? And that's good. That's another, that's another <laughs> sermon for another day. But uh, in my cell phone, just like you guys, are a lot of important stuff, right? If you were to get my cell phone and get past the keypad and all that stuff, you would have access to my financial well-being, my bank account. That's in here. You could actually get into my uh, house because my alarm system, I can turn it off and turn it on right here. So access to my home and my cell phone. I have pictures in here of my wife and my daughters and videos that I haven't uploaded anywhere else that if I were to lose this, those would be gone forever. You know, that's, that's important to me. Probably one of the more important things is my livelihood. Like I was telling you guys, I'm a pilot. I fly for Delta. I carry this cell phone around, and when I'm in Atlanta, I'm on a two-hour call out. And if this doesn't work or this is lost and they call me, I'm on probation still. It's not an exaggeration. I'll get fired. So there's some importance in this. Ultimately, it's, it's just, a, you know, I can replace it. It's not the most important thing in the world, but it's important. So to my story, I don't know, a month ago or whatever, and uh, I was telling Jenny this, and I guess she was there because she came and flew with, flew with me. The girls came. We flew to Nashville. It was great on the airplane or whatever. But about a month ago, I was uh, – Getting in Atlanta Airport is kind of, kind of, if you don't understand, it's kind of confusing. There's trains that run between the different concourses, and then you come up, and then there's the gates and everything. And so we were coming up off of one of the trains, and for whatever reason, instead of taking the escalator, we took the elevator. And right before we got in, this lady ran in. And on her look was panic and fear. You could see it in her eyes. This, she was scared. She was almost crying and everything. And maybe because she was so panicked or maybe because she needed information, she turns to us and she's like, oh, and tells us, hey, I, I, lost, I lost my cell phone. I left it uh, at gate A such and such on the airplane. And so in her panic, she's like, I got to get back to the airplane. I got to go get my cell phone, which is understandable. you know. And this is just an example. I don't know this lady's heart. I don't know where she is or anything, so don't read too much into it. But just, just roll with the example. But it wasn't, it wasn't, the fact that she was direct, it wasn't the fact that she was, I need to go and get it. I mean, ev I would be too if I left my cell phone on an airplane. I'd say, hey, it's time to go get my cell phone. It wasn't that. It was the loss of control, and it was the panic and the fear and the fact that she was almost crying. So fast forward to some other time, a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago. I'm there at the airport in Atlanta. And if you guys don't know, underneath all of that, there's a whole other world. It, you know, There's a pilot lounge, and we got recliners and TVs, and we can sleep there. And there's a, uh, at A27, if you ever go there and you see any pilot types running around a wall in A27, there's a gym downstairs, right? So I was going there, and I was hanging around with nothing to do, so I was going to the gym. I took a shower, and as I was getting out, I put on my clothes, and I noticed that where I normally keep my cell phone, it wasn't there. And so I'm like, oh, okay, well, let me look for it. I, got, I had one bag, and I went through everything in that bag and all the pockets, and cell phone wasn't there. So and to make a long story short, I'm going, I'm checking everything, going back to the pilot lounge, and as I'm doing this, I'm checking and realizing I don't have my cell phone. This story popped into my head, this, the example of this lady. And like I said, I don't always think the right things, and I don't always have the right view of God. But it, in this instance, at the risk of trying to build myself up, I'm not trying to do that at all, but in this instance, I thought about that, and I thought about the fear and the hopelessness she had when she lost her cell phone. And I thought, Lord, and a smile came on my face. It's a true story. And I said, Lord, if I've lost my cell phone, I hope I find it, but if I've lost my cell phone and they call me and I can't make it to the airplane and they fire me, praise God. Because I pray for favor in my life just like you guys do. You know, I pray for my family just like you guys do. If you pray for a safe drive to work and you get hit by a car, nobody's going to be happy about that, right? 
But praise God, because if you believe this verse, that all things work together for the good of those who love God, to those who've been called according to his purpose, if you really are a big God Christian and you really believe that, sometimes stuff's going to happen to you and it's not going to be fun. But praise God, because he's doing something about it for your good, eternal good, and his glory. So for once in my life, I actually had the right outlook, right? And it, it makes for, the, uh, for an illustration to this point. I hope and I pray, and this is just a cell phone, right? I hope and I pray I have that exact same outlook if something more important happened, if something were happened to my family. Because it's a lot easier said than done, right? And I haven't lost someone really close. I've lost grandparents like everybody. I've lost people. But I've never lost a daughter. I've never lost my wife. But I pray, and I pray for you guys, I pray that the Lord would help us to keep this outlook if that ever happens. And then be like Job says. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We need to, regardless of how difficult it is, we need to be big God Christians. The second verse is in Matthew 10, 28. It says, do not be afraid of those that kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear the one that can destroy both the body and the soul in hell. And in the context, it's when Jesus is sending out the disciples, and obviously there's people that didn't like what they had to say. He's saying, sure, yeah, there's people that want to kill you, but don't worry about that. Fear God. Fear him. And I, and I picked this verse because death, for most of us, is the ultimate thing. Losing someone, it's final. That's it, in this life. It's the thing that I think we fear the most about our loved ones and the people that are around us. We fear them dying. But I think we can extrapolate something out of this verse that, that talks to the nature of God. I think we can safely say, not only don't fear those that can kill the body but not destroy the soul, but don't fear anything, right? Fear the one that's in control of it all. Don't fear getting sick. Don't fear losing your job. Don't fear any of that stuff. Because if you are a big God Christian, these two verses, if you really believe what they're saying, he's in control of it all. He's holding the reins on sickness and death. And he can pull back or he can let go in his divine providence, but he's in control. So the question is, do we believe that or not? I was uh, deployed to Kandahar, Afghanistan for eight months flying a different airplane. Actually, I missed the birth of my daughter. But when I was there, I started a Bible study, and I invited two or three guys that I thought would come and would get something out of it. And during that Bible study, well, let me, let me backtrack really quick. For all you, all you military guys, does anybody know what general order number one is in the context of religion? I mean, it's beaten to our heads. Anybody been overseas recently? I guess we don't have anybody. General order number one says no proselytizing. It's in there. No proselytizing. And so I'm not acting like I'm, you know, super Christian. I had a Bible study when General Orban, in the face of General Orban, number one, that said no proselytizing. No, it's kind of understood that if people agree to it, that it's, it's okay. But down the road from where our base was, or where our compound was in Kandahar uh, Air Base, down the road on the flight line was a squadron of Afghani helicopter pilots. And you interacted. We had different childs and stuff, but you would pass them. You would interact with them. So fast forward again to the Bible study. I'm there with uh, those three guys who uh, they said they're Christians, and we don't judge cri people's eternal destiny. We leave that up to the Lord. There's things we can judge, but if someone says they're a Christian, we can judge their fruits. But they said they're Christians. So these three guys, Christians, in this Bible study, and I kind of just threw this kind of big God question at them. I said, hey, I'm not saying the Lord would come down and show himself to you, but if in your heart, he, you knew the Lord was telling you to go and share the message with that Afghani over there in the face of general order number one. Would you do it? And I kind of expected the way I would feel, like, mm, you know, that's scary. I could, you know, get thrown in prison, you know, literally get thrown in prison for doing that. I could hurt our international relationships with them because they don't like that whole Christian thing too much over there, right? And I, I'd be scared, but hopefully... Like I'm, I was praying earlier, I pray that if you did tell me, and I knew you were telling me to go sh spread the gospel and share it with that Afghani, that I would do it. And that's what I expected to hear from three Christians in a Bible study. It might be difficult. Maybe I don't have the strength. Maybe I'd get too scared. But I'd like to think I would do it. 
but it blew my mind. That's not what I heard. First of all, I didn't hear anything. I was just looking at them. And the looks on their face told me, like, whoa, they're, they're not buying this. And I talked to him about it. And then one of them, I talked to him a little more. And he's like, nah, that's not, you know, the human, the ha. Huh, no, he wouldn't ask you to do that, da, 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 da. And I was like, wow. We've got to be big God Christians. We can't fear those things. We can't fear getting thrown in jail. We can't fear getting sick. We can't fear any of that stuff. If our God is big enough, then we're bound to do stuff or be asked to do stuff that seems crazy to the world. The world asks questions like, hey, how can you go there? You might get hurt. How can you take your kids into that country? They might get hurt. How could you go and minister to those people in West Africa if you're a doctor? You might get Ebola. That seems crazy to the world. But if you don't serve a big God and all you have is this life, then like Paul said, eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow you're going to die, right? That's all you got is this life. You don't have that eternal focus. You have a temporal focus or an earthly focus, a worldly focus. And all you're concerned about is your life because that's all you've got. But that's not okay if we're Christians. That's not okay. We have to have that eternal focus. We shouldn't fear those things. If God came to you right now and said, hey, I want you to leave your family, go to Iran, which is a Muslim country, which is hostile to the gospel, and share the good news. If God spoke to your heart right now, think about it. You guys sitting right here, would you do it? This guy did that. And yeah, he, his background, he is Persian, so he knew the language and all that stuff, but he, he's an American pastor. His name is Saeed Abedini, and he did that. God told him to go, and he went. And guess what? He paid the price. He was incarcerated in 2012, serving an eight-year sentence on trumped-up charges because he was spreading the gospel in Iran. I tell you what, that's a big guy Christian. I put his picture up here so you could see him and pray for him. Let's pray for those people that are out there doing the stuff that we can only hope that we would have the, the, uh, the faith to do. So I, I encourage you guys, pray for him. And I heard just two days ago, I guess the Senate passed something to say that they're going to put some pressure on Iran or something. Who knows? But I, I tell you what, like in 1 Corinthians, he is building a spiritual building with costly materials, with precious jewels, with stones that will stand the test of the fire when it comes. He will. I pray that I, pray that I would too and that you guys will too. Jenny and I have another friend. Her name's Haley. We went to church with her in, uh, when we were stationed out in California. Haley, at 25 years old, felt the Lord telling her that she needed to go to Western China and minister to the Uyghur people. There are a people group in Western China that is Muslim. Muslims aren't exactly accepting of the gospel. But Haley is a big God Christian, and she went. At 25 years old, she's over there. She went she, with uh, Sim USA. She learned the language for so, so many months, and she went. The Lord said go, she went. Her family could not understand it. I remember her talking to us about this. Her family couldn't believe it. They were like, what are you doing? You're young. you got your whole life ahead of you, and you're going to Western China to hang out with some Muslims? Her family, needless to say, aren't believers. She's the only believer in her family. But Haley's looking past that. She's looking past that. So if your God isn't big enough, some of this stuff is going to dominate your thinking. These questions, these fears, it's going to dominate everything. You're going to be temporally focused. And when I say that, I mean you're going to be earthly focused. You're going to walk around walking by sight and not by faith. You don't have a choice. You don't understand how big your God is. Either you don't know, because all those verses, I read those verses for a reason, to just say how amazing, how magnificent the God of the universe is. Either you don't know that, it's ignorance, or you don't care. It's one of the two. But if you're a Christian, neither one of those is really a good excuse. If you don't know, go learn. If you don't care, take a really good gut check of where you are in your faith. Christians whose God is little is not big enough to handle their problems. And their problems will dominate their lives, and they will succumb to those problems. It happens all the time whether it's death or divorce or whatever it is, you'll succumb to those problems because your God's not big enough to handle it. 
Well, we said he's obviously big enough to handle it, but your view of him isn't. So therefore, you are not going to let his providence control your life. Small God Christians, they live with less faith, and they blend in with the world. I uh, started a Bible study. Before I left the base, I was on there full-time before I went to Delta. So now I'm part-time at the base down there at Lackland. And before I, before I left, started a Bible study, got some of the believers together, um, and some people that weren't believers, and we were having it on Thursdays. And so I'm leaving to go to Delta, and a buddy of mine that I worked with in Dover Air Force Base actually came down and took my old job. So as he's coming down, I'm kind of filling him in on everything. And this buddy of mine, I was in a Bible study in Dover, Delaware. He's a Christian. He's a believer, a really strong believer. And so as he comes in to take over my job, I'm filling him in on the stuff that really matters, the spiritual state of our squadron that he was coming into. And I'm telling him, hey, this person's a believer. This person's not. We're praying for this person. She is moving in that direction. The Lord's working on her heart. And I'm filling him in on all that. And I say, hey, and -and so-and-so over here is a believer. And I told Jenny this, and it kind of just knocked me back for a second because I actually thought about the implication. He said, oh, really? I never would have guessed. And the so-and-so I'm talking about, I've had a ton of conversations with him. I know he's a believer, but he's let the cares of this world and the struggles and everything pretty much just tuck that away deep inside of him. So much so that he is blended in with the world. And when I would tell somebody so-and-so is a believer, they would say, oh, really? To me, that's one of the scariest things that could happen to me. We can't be small God Christians so much so that we blend in the world that people don't even know that we're a believer. Our God's got to be bigger than that. It's got to be bigger than our problems. We have to be able to appreciate his awesome and incomprehensible power. Because in that, going back to the beginning of this whole thing, in that knowledge of him and how amazing he is, is given us everything we need to live a godly life. Everything. In our knowledge of him, right here, his revealed knowledge, we talked about it. Everything we need to live a godly life, everything we need to have the correct view of God so when those sucker punches come, we can still give him glory. And ultimately, that's what it's for. When, when you know, life gets its worst, we can turn it back to God. And that the world will see him through the way that we're living. So I'll finish with this, you know, just the question I had up there. Knowing God, or knowing him, question mark. Are you continuously knowing him? Are you reading the Bible? If you're not, gut check. Gut check. (laughs) Your God might be a little too small. Because you're not going to know him if you're not reading it. If you're not, just do it. And I understand not having time for a lot of stuff. I don't have time for a lot of stuff. I understand that. You know, here at Vista, we encourage you to serve. We encourage you to get into real life groups. Because that's the way you live life one-on-one. You grow together, right? But I understand sometimes you work a little late and you can't do that. I understand sometimes you work during uh, Sundays and you can't come. I understand not having time for stuff, but you know what? There's really no excuse for not having time for learning more about the Lord because ultimately, if your God's big enough, you realize that this life isn't it. This isn't it. There's spiritual truths, if you're eternally focused, that go well beyond what you're seeing in front of you, your work, your family, your job, your school, whatever it is. So there's no excuse for it. And I found myself giving those excuses too. I was talking to James once. He gave me a book. He's like, ooh, uh, and I said something like, I don't really have a lot of time now. I got two jobs, and I got to, you know, hang out with my daughters and everything. I don't know if if I have time to read it. Let's just be honest. Let's substitute I don't have time with I don't have the desire. So that's what it's really about. And that's where that gut check comes. Because I had time. And when I really thought about it, I'm like, man, I fly to Atlanta twice, you know, every week. That's a two-hour flight. I could pull out my cell phone, which also has a Bible on it, and I can read. And I did. I read through Romans. I read through 1 Corinthians. I'm doing other stuff. I'm trying to redeem. I'm trying to listen to myself as I'm preaching here. You guys have time to know the infinite God of the universe. So at the beginning, I said, if all this stuff sounds like foolishness to you, just hang with me. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, The message of the cross is foolishness 
to those who are perishing. So let me tell you what that message is really quick. If you don't know who Jesus Christ is, like I said, his holiness has separated us for eternity because we're sinners. And he transcended space and time, lived a life, and died to atone for those sins. That's who Jesus Christ is. That's, that's the saving work of the gospel. If you don't know that, and the Holy Spirit's working on your heart, today's a better day than any to accept who he is. Because it's foolishness to those who are perishing. And if it sounds like foolishness, I didn't say it, the Bible did. It's probably perishing. I know that's tough. But anyways, knowing God, knowing God, knowing him. So if you bow with me, we'll close in uh, prayer.